My lords, ladies and, and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the uh, lecture tonight, Shedding Light on Trafalgar and Waterloo. Um, and on behalf of the um, Works of Art Committee in the House of Lords, I am delighted to welcome you. The paintings of the Battle of Trafalgar and the Battle of Waterloo um, are two of the most significant paintings commissioned for the Palace of Westminster. However, the great excitement that both paintings had after they were done was very quickly and very sadly overshadowed as technical problems uh, with both paintings soon emerged. And over the decades that followed, a number of attempts were made to improve their failing appearance. The collaborative research project with the University of Applied Sciences at the University of Cologne um, is what you're going to hear about tonight. And it's of great importance to the House of Lords and indeed to the Works of Art Committee in the House of Lords. And I'm going to begin, before I hand over to Adrian Heritage, who's going to talk to you tonight, um, by doing a little bit of housekeeping. Um, first of all, this is being recorded, it's being filmed, so please uh, turn off any mobile phones. Um, Next one, in the event of a vote in the House of Lords, um, you will hear division bells ringing. They'll ring fairly loudly. Um, members who are attending the lecture will go at that point to vote. And while the bell is ringing, um, either if I'm talking or if Adrian is talking, at that point, um, the lecture will stop for a few moments and then, then we'll carry on. If the fire alarm should go off, um, we will all be asked to leave the committee room and staff will advise you on which exit to use um, when you're leaving the building. I'm going to give a very short historical um, context to the lecture that Adrian is going to give. Um, the main focus tonight is going to be on the conservation research which both um, Adrian and indeed the um, MA students sitting on the, on the right here, um, Simon Gebler, Simon Gebler, and Geraldine Krauthäuser are working on. We're halfway through the project at the moment and the information you'll get tonight will take note of what's been achieved and what's been found over that six month period. At the end we will have, I hope, ten minutes for questions. We'll, we'll throw the floor open at that point. So if I can begin with um, some historical context information. The Royal Gallery on the slide we're looking at in the State Apartments uh, was the largest of all the rooms in the new Victorian Palace of Westminster, built as we know between the 1840s and the 1860s. And it formed a key part of the Grand Processional Route used by the monarch at State Opening of Parliament. There were 18 large wall compartments arranged on two levels. Six on the upper level, twelve on the lower level. And the Fine Arts Commission, headed by Prince Albert, who were in charge of determining which works of art would be picked for which uh, interior, they determined that um, the theme for the Royal Gallery would be um, the history of the nation in battle. In other words, celebrating the heroic achievements of the nation in battle. And the two most important um, battle um, scenes from the Victorian or within Victorian living memory were the Battle of Waterloo and the Battle of Trafalgar and they were to occupy the largest of the wall compartments at the lower level. Daniel MacLeese was selected as the artist to carry out the work. It was the most high profile and significant commission for the entire Palace of Westminster. He had, he was given to understand that he would do all 18 wall compartments. A massive undertaking and it was the absolute pinnacle of his artistic career. And yet less than 20 years after he had completed the paintings in the mid-1860s the biographer William Bates um, described the last decade of Daniel MacLeese's involvement at the palace as causing dire injury to his health, serious loss to his pocket and bitter disappointment to his expectations. So what happened? Um, MacLeese wasn't new to the Houses of Parliament. 
He'd already completed two wall paintings in the House of Lords debating chamber. And he'd had to learn the highly disciplined technique of fresco painting. The paintings in the Royal Gallery were intended to be in fresco. Fresco was the um, most um, noble form of art. The Fine Arts Commissioners felt it highly appropriate for this major public building. Maclise began with the painting of the Battle of Waterloo. The subject chosen was the meeting of Wellington and Blücher, who headed the Prussian forces, at La Belle Alliance after or late on in the, in the battle. And it was a subject that symbolised the Anglo-Prussian alliance, which had finally brought the Napoleonic Wars to a close. And Maclise chose to um, depict the subject after the battle had been fought and won and victory had been assured. He spent a year carrying out very detailed research. He built up all the information on the soldiers' uniforms. He talked to people who'd been in the battle. He wanted the action to be believable. He began the cartoon of the large paper drawing, the cartoon, in March 1858. And it was put on show in the Royal Gallery in June 1859. The reaction was incredibly positive. His excellent draftsmanship and ability to work on highly complex compositions were greatly admired. The art journal commented, this is the greatest work of its class that has been produced in England, nor is there any painter of the continent who has surpassed it. When MacLeese began the job of painting after the cartoon had got such wonderful praise, uh, he began in July 1859, and joy very quickly turned to despair. He was deeply unhappy that the level of detail he wanted to include <coughs> was proving very complex in the medium of fresco. It was so bad that Maclise wanted to pull out of the commission, and he proposed instead painting in oil on canvas his familiar, his known way of painting. And he said that if the paintings were done on canvas, on panel, they would look like wall paintings. Um, Prince Albert was not to be moved on the idea. And he's noted as having said, the spot which is to be decorated by painting absolutely requires monumental treatment. He says, he further goes on, a grand historical work requires a sacrifice of the details that Maclise knew um, he wanted to include. He said fresco is a protection to Mr. Maclise against himself and ensures his rising to uh, a height as an artist, which he cannot himself comprehend as yet. However, it was Prince Albert who proposed the way forward and he suggested Maclise go to Germany to study the recently developed um, medium of water glass. And the advantage of water glass was that it took away much of the rigid discipline of fresco painting. The painting was finished <coughs> with amazing speed in December 1861, and contemporary comment was once again highly favourable. The art journal called it the greatest work of its class that has ever been seen in England. And again, looking over to what was happening on the continent, they said, nor is there any painter of the continent who has surpassed it, not even Kalbach. Kalbach was a German painter painting in, in, in Berlin at exactly the same period. Um, MacLeese then went on to paint the Battle of Trafalgar, and that was completed again in water glass and the technique of water glass in late 1865. Only four years later, a few months before MacLeese died, at a time when the um, statues, which were gilded stone, were going into the um, Royal Gallery, um, the art journal came back with its final comment, saying, we look eagerly forward to the removal of these unfortunate frescoes, which year by year blacken on the wall. This would seem a good point to hand over to Professor Adrian Heritage, sitting on my right, Professor of Wall Paintings Conservation at Cologne University of Applied Sciences to tell you more about 
the exciting project to look at the issues related to um, the technique and what might be done as part of the collaborative research project. Adrian. Thank you very much. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, it's truly heartening to see a full house, such keen interest. But this isn't surprising given the remarkable paintings of Daniel McLeese in the Royal Gallery. It gives me great pleasure this evening to present the research project to you and provide some preliminary results of this work in progress. Although I'm the designated speaker this evening, the two most important members of our team are here on my right, uh, Geraldine Krauthäuser and Simon Gabler. Both Geraldine and Simon are qualified diploma conservators graduating from our university in 2009. Since this time, they've been working as freelance conservators in Germany. And although they did not feel comfortable to speak tonight in English, they will be answering questions, your questions, after my talk. Even before undertaking our quite testing entrance examinations for our di diploma course, our students are required to undertake a practical training in conservation. And it's this blending of theory with conservation practice which is so important for us in conservation. So as a result of this, I'm very fortunate to have two very capable ex-diploma students who are now available to undertake this research at master's level on the paintings in Westminster. Our approach, together with the curator's office, is to explore the potential for remedial, that is to say direct treatment, such as cleaning, but also to investigate the aesthetic issues with an aim of improving the presentation of the two paintings. The first of the two master's projects has been undertaken by Geraldine Krauthäuser. McLeese's use of water glass for the Royal Gallery wall paintings within the context of wider development of the technique in Germany, including testing and proposals for conservation. The second theme is being undertaken by Simon. His subject is the assessment of the physical history and surface materials and proposals for the presentation of the Royal Gallery wall paintings and further preventive care. So project one, addresses the conservation issues of the McLeese paintings, the physical history, original technique, added altered materials, a condition assessment, together with the conservation treatment and proposals for treatment. And project two addresses the aesthetic issues of the McLeese paintings. Why do they appear as they do today? And to what extent does this result from a failure, failure in their original technique? or from their physical history. Zeman will also be undertaking testing with the aim to optimise the lighting conditions and improve the presentation of the paintings. The MA projects began in March this year and will be finished in March 2013, with myself as first examiner and my colleague Professor Dr Jaegers as second examiner. Professor Jaegers is also supervising the pigment and media analysis together with the students. The structure of my talk is as follows. And although I will try not to skip over important, as important aspects, please forgive me if here and there I don't dwell as you would like or give it as many examples as you would like. But I want to provide enough time for you to give questions to the students, and possibly myself and Malcolm and Caroline. Um, but I do want to cover a little bit more of the background to the artists and the context of the two paintings. I want to tell you a bit about what is water, water glass, what is the technique, and why did they use it. Something about the phys physical history and preliminary results and work still to do. Born Daniel McLeish in Cork, Ireland in 1806, the young McLeish began training as a painter and illustrator in the Cork Institute of Arts, in fact against the wishes of his father, who was quite a simple man, a shoe mender. 
1827, he moves to London and enters the Royal Academy schools. He was immediately successful. Indeed, in 1831, he was awarded a gold medal for history painting at the Royal Academy schools. First in 1835, he begins to spell his name Maclise. His career flourishes, and he is quickly immersed in London's cultural scene. In 1839, Maclise paints this portrait of his friend, Charles Dickens. The following year, Maclise illustrates the old curiosity shop. I quote from Dante Gabriel Rossetti. I suppose no such series of the portraits of celebrated persons of an epoch produced by an eye and hand of so much insight and power and realised with such a view to the actual impression of the sitter exists anywhere. This was posthumous praise from Rossetti following the death of Maclise in 1870. However, I should point out that Mary Ann Evans, better known as George Eliot, Eliot, said that this portrait of Dickens suffered from odious beautification. <laughs> the fact of the matter was that Maclise was popular. He was a popular painter and illustrator, and hence much in demand. But it is Maclise's talents as a history painter that came to the attention of Prince Albert. It was William Dice who recommended Maclise to Prince Albert as the best painter to undertake the history frescoes in the new palace of Westminster. Here I show you the two monumental murals in the Royal Gallery. The meeting of Wellington and Blücher after the Battle of Waterloo, completed in 1861, and the death of Nelson at Trafalgar, completed in 1865. In 1841, the following the appointment of a select committee to promote the fine arts of Britain in connection with the rebuilding of the Houses of Parliament, the Fine Arts Commission is appointed to direct the commissioning and production, production of works at Westminster. As Malcolm Hay has said, um, Prince Albert is president. Sir Charles Eastlake is secretary to the commission. Eastlake was later appointed first uh, keeper of the National Gallery, as you know, in 1843. The commission intended that history, painted, uh, that history painting would be commissioned, and they wanted these paintings to be executed, as Malcolm has said, in the noblest of arts, fresco. As Vasari called it, the manly art of fresco painting. In 48, Maclise is contra contracted to undertake the spirit of chivalry fresco, in the House of Lords. And this was followed by the Spirit of Justice, again in fresco technique, the following year. The commissioning process was complicated and distressing for the, ad for the artists involved. And Maclise had to push hard to gain the contract for the Royal Gallery murals. Nonetheless, as an example of Maclise's standing, in 1858 he is commissioned to paint 18 history paintings of British history in the Royal Gallery for a sum of £23,000. He didn't get all of the money. These paintings, Waterloo and Trafalgar, designed to fill the large central spaces in the Royal Gallery, were the only painters, paintings completed and paid for under the contract. In 1864, the Fine Arts Commission was dissolved following the death of Prince Albert in 1861. Maclise must have been exhausted seven years of work in the Royal Gallery. He withdrew from many social engagements, much to the annoyance of Dickens, and he dedicated his time to completing these two monumental works. The disappointment of being sacked for completing the commission was, um, from completing the commission was difficult for him to come to terms with, and Maclise died five years later in 1870 at the age of 64. If we look at the aesthetic qualities of these paintings, Maclise was not a great colourist. His strengths lay in brilliant draughtsmanship, which was enthusiastically praised by his contemporaries, but also in his narrative and composition, which was often undervalued by some of his contemporary critics. On completion of the Royal Gallery murals, they were generally well received. Both Waterloo and Trafalgar are not comfortable views of history, but immensely powerful narrative statements. From Maclise's inclusion of heroic women and heroic black sailors aboard the Victory, to the inclusion of heroic Irishmen and Highlanders at Waterloo, these were not the products of a received contemporary English view, but rather an intelligent 
brave and intensely personal, personal statement by MacLeese, an Irish immigrant of Scottish descent. Before continuing, let us take a few minutes to look at a detail from Waterloo. More gory than glory. This is not merely a representation of a famous victory, but a depiction of carnage and terror of battle and loss of life on both sides. The attention to detail is extreme and meticulously researched by MacLeese. I quote from Major Fry's contemporary account recorded at the battlefield on the 22nd of June, 1815. This morning I went to visit the field of battle, which is a little beyond the village of Waterloo, on the plateau of Mont Saint-Jean. But on arrival, there the sight was too horrible to behold. I felt sick to the stomach, to the stomach and was obliged to return. The multitude of carcasses, the heaps of wounded men, with mangled limbs, unable to move, and perishing from not having their wounds dressed or from hunger, formed a spectacle I shall never forget. The wounded, both of the Allies and the French, remain in an equally deplorable state. As Richard Orman put it in his 1968 article on Daniel MacLeese in the Burlington Magazine, Wellington and Blücher, shaken hands above the twisted bodies of dead and wounded, are not conquering heroes, but grim survivors. Before pr proceeding to tell you about the water glass technique of painting, first I show you this example detail of Waterloo, illustrating, I think, the aesthetic issues with the paintings in their current state and with their current lighting. MacLeese's paintings were reported to be in a, con in a poor condition only, matter in only years after they were first painted. The perception at the time was that there had been a failure of original technique. However, water glass can be an excellent painting method and was used successfully at Westminster by Ward and Cope for the mural paintings in the corridors off the central lobby. As a means of contrast, here the Modelo in quarter size for the death of Nelson at Trafalgar, now in the Walker Gallery, Liverpool. Albeit executed in the much more luminous oil painting technique, it gives perhaps some impression of how the coloration might have been 151 years ago. The oil painting is a very large finished study. However, the dimensions of the Royal Gallery paintings are vast. In total, 100 square meters of highly detailed painting. Here the location of the Westminster paintings in their architectural context, under the windows of the Royal Gallery. The wall construction is stone ashlar facing on brick. The plaster is not attached directly to the brick, but onto a wooden lath construction with an air gap between this and the exterior wall. The intention was to help the paint isolate the painting from the damp exterior wall. As mentioned above, the Fine Art Commission wanted all the murals to be undertaken in fresco because of the longevity and monumentality of the fresco technique as perfected in Italy. Organic materials, such as oils and glues, would darken and deteriorate in the damp environment and were considered inferior to fresco. Under this instruction, MacLeese begins painting in the Royal Gallery in fresco. The fresco technique proves troublesome, and after just one month, he wants to give up. On the advice of Prince Albert, MacLeese undertakes a study tour to Berlin, Munich and Dresden, to research the water glass technique of painting. So why did MacLeese move away from fresco for the Royal Gallery paintings? Well, buon fresco, or good fresco, needs to be executed on wet or damp plaster to ensure that the painting, the pigments, are bound in a calcium carbonate matrix. This means that there's very limited time to paint before the, paint becomes, the plaster becomes dry and the paint no longer adheres to the plaster. Here we see the most famous example of fresco painting by Michelangelo, here the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican. In Buon fresco painting, the design is painted in small individual portions of plaster called giornata. Anything larger would result in the plaster drying before completion, 
and the pigments would not adequate, be adequately bound. In contrast, water glass could be painted on a single layer of dry plaster, and the amount of time it took to paint any single part was no longer an issue. I quote from MacLeese's detailed technical report on water glass painting. He first mentions fresco. A very small portion of these details could only pa be painted on the fresh laid plaster each day in the old fresco process. And therefore, in the progress of the work, would ne nece necessitate innumerable joinings of the plaster and give rise to such complicated and minute cuttings that it would be not be possible to get a mason to execute them. While the ground for a painting in stereochromy, water glass, is laid all at once, and the work can be left and resumed at pleasure. Taking nothing away from the beauty and power of Michelangelo's frescoes, the fresco technique was not best suited to the demands for detail and accuracy expected for the Victorian painters. This comparison of details from the Michelangelo in fresco and MacLeese in stereochrome shows, I think, the difference in detail. I quote from T.J. Gullock, the Italian religious painter worked in absolute independence of many historical facts and details. He chose whatever scenes and draperies he pleased. He painted directly for the imagination. But modern antiquarian research has made us all so critical that if an artist nowadays were to treat many historical themes as they might have been treated by a painter, fettered as little as were the Italian ma masters, he would run great risk of being laughed at. MacLeese was given no such opportunity for fanciful imagination. For example, even Nelson's hat and costume were the original items supplied to MacLeese as an authentic source for his painting. Water glass. Despite the Irish collection with MacLeese, this has nothing to do with Waterford glass. Water glass was developed in Germany and first produced by the chemist and mineralogist Dr. Johann Nepomuk Fuchs in 1818. Interestingly, its first major commercial use was as a fire retardant for fabrics and wood. Hence, MacLeese is paid to undertake a study trip to Germany together with Lady Eastlake as translator to research the stereochrome technique of painting using water glass to fix the pig pigments. In 1846, the chemist, Fuchs, together with the painter, Josef Schlotthauer, had developed in Munich a painting technique based on water glass, which they called stereochromy, from the Greek stereos, for solid, fixed, or firm, and chroma, color, and stereochromy, meaning enduring color. In the stereochrome technique, the pigments are applied in pure distilled water to dry plaster. After the painting is complete, the area is fixed by spraying the liquid glass on the surface of the plaster, and on drying, the pigments are bound in a fast silicate matrix. On drying, the previously soluble solution becomes insoluble. Dr. Pettenkoffer of Munich was the leading chemist involved with water glass following the death of Fuchs in 1856. It was this new technique, developed first in Munich and then used elsewhere in Germany, most notably in the Neue Museum in Berlin, which Prince Albert promoted and led to MacLeese's study visit in, 18, in 1859. Herewith, one of the earliest surviving examples of stereochrome polychromy, uh, painting, sorry, Philip Foltus's Nymphendarstellung, dating from 1851, in Feld Affing, Rosen Insel, southern Germany. This is recorded by Gerard Boone in a recent visit to Germany. In a letter to MacLeese dating 19, 19th of November 1859, Pettenkofer recommends that only potassium water glass should be used. The other option would have been sodium water glass. MacLeese had material samples of both types of water glass and other equipment necessary for the application of, on the wall sent from London to Munich. MacLeese was, was very keen to know how to apply the water glass fixative. 
May not the water glass be applied with a soft brush in the fixing process, McLeese asks. Herr Dielitz replies, nein, no, translated as no. The syringe alone is to be used and carefully so that the water glass be equal everywhere. Or everywhere equal. Among the materials and equipment sent to London was a water glass sprinkler represented here with a glass flask to hold the water glass and a pump action, which by all accounts was very tiring to use. Indeed, Pettenkoffer had recommended the use of a foot-operated bellows sprinkler, which was sent to London, but MacLeese reported the instrument has, after all, not arrived. It should be noted that the palace was still under construction and the conditions for, paint for painting were not ideal. MacLeese complained of the dampness dust, soot, uneven light from the windows, workmen above him on ladders with buckets of beer. To quote MacLeese himself on the conditions in the Royal Gallery at the time, worst of all, the place is a perfect carpenter's shop. Royal Gallery, I know the architect had, a, had much pride in it. Royal Lumber Room is a fitter name for it. The plastering was undertaken under MacLeese's direction and the quality of the finish is more regular but coarser on the later Trafalgar painting, indicating that the plastering of Waterloo was not wholly to his satisfaction and that improvements were sought after the experience of completing the first painting. This inorganic technique, water glass, was preferable to the organic binders, a secco, that is on dry plaster. As mentioned earlier, organic materials like glues, oils, waxes, etc., are more prone to deterioration on the wall than silicate or quartz, which is the same material as flint, or the sand in the plaster. MacLeave was fastidious in respect to his research into the technique of stereochromy. Above and beyond his direct instruction and research in Germany, on his return to London, MacLeave undertook numerous tests and further correspondence with his German advisers. He seems to have adapted, or better said, refined the technique into a sort of glazing technique, with little or no attempt to create impasto or structure with the paint lead. Theoretically, this means that he would have needed very little water glass to bind the pigments he would apply. Here in this watercolour by the Scottish artist John Ballantyne, we see MacLeese at work on his raised platform, his assistant grinding, grinding his pigments in water. Perhaps the eagle-eyed among you can see a certain contraption carefully positioned among his painting materials and equipment. Here we have the water glass sprinkler used to spray the liquid glass on the pigments to fix the pig pigments permanently to the plaster. An important aspect of the student research is an assessment of the physical history of the paintings. Here is an example of the lighting issues from the archive. To quote Gullick, we feel it our duty to remark that working in the Royal Gallery has proved disadvantageous to Mr. MacLeese, both as regards the execution of and the ultimate effect of his paintings. The reader will best realise this, the, what these disadvantages are and have been, if he goes to see the artist's pictures on a sunny day. He will then have his pleasure somewhat diminished by finding several very beautiful but entirely inappropriate colours vaguely creeping over the picture. This is attributable to the picture being lit by the rays which pass through stained glass. But a more serious disadvantage is the blinding general glare from the windows above the pictures and from which it is impossible to escape when at the proper point of station for viewing such large works. Gullick informs us that it would have been the avowed, it was the avowed intention of the late Prince Consort to recommend that the emblazoned windows should be done away and let light in from the roof onto the pictures. As we've heard, we eagerly look forward to the removal of these unfortunate frescoes. The tragedy for Mac MacLeese was that not only was his contract drastically reduced, although it seems he was handsomely paid for his labours on Waterloo and Trafalgar, he would have earned considerably more money taking portrait commissions in that time. And furthermore, the permanence of his work, that is to say his technique, 
is now in question, a year before his death. It's no wonder the poor man died in 1870. An account from T.S.R. Bortz, published in 1990, is based on many detailed contemporary records in the Westminster Archive. And it begins, There remains for consideration the work of Maclise in the Royal Gallery. The two huge, huge, wall paint, uh, huge wall paintings of Wellington's meeting with Luca and the death of Nelson. The colours are darkened and there is a heavy film of dirt on their surfaces. Unshielded radiators beneath the central groups had blackened the focal points. The frescoes early showed some mildew, mildew growth and have received hard treatment. Some error in the use of silicate led to minute flaking so that they are covered with small white spots that give a greyish appearance to the whole. The scheme for the room has never been completed so that the long dark rectangles have an ill-placed effect and the light that they require is obscured by the stained glass windows of which Maclise complained. Yet by any standard they remain major works. To, pro to quote Professor Church, the chemist and advisor to the government. The increased and increasing consumption of coal in London and the greater licence allowed to the gas companies is in, in the matter of freeing their gas from sulphur compounds must result in a serious augmentation of sulphuric acid in the air of the metropolis. It is this acid which, constitu which constitutes the chief destructive agency at work on pictorial and other artistic productions. Earlier, from the um, volume three of the New Palace of Westminster from 1878, I quote, the decay in the case of Waterloo showed itself by an efflorescence which spread itself over the whole surface of the picture. And towards the close of 1874, the picture was subjected to chemical treatment under the superintendence of Mr. Richmond RA, apparently with success. There followed a series of treatments, first from Mr. Richmond with silk dusters and warm water, in 1888 cleaning with an air blast from bellows. In 1894, the examination by Professor Church, he recommended cleaning by flicking the entire surface with pads of cotton wool enclosed in soft linen handkerchiefs and sponging with an abundance of distilled water. In 1897, again cleaning by air blast, careful dusting and using a so-called breadcrumb distributor and an application of paraffin wax. The paraffin wax was driven into the plaster by heat using a flame gun. These treatments continued into the 20th century with applications of beeswax on both the paintings in the 1930s. Now I think you begin to understand the present condition of these paintings as a result of their history. We have undertaken related investigations. An inspection of Maclise's cartoons for the Battle of Waterloo was kindly arranged by colleagues of the Royal Academy, and we were privileged to inspect the cartoons on June the 19th this year at an RA storage facility, together with their conservators and exhibitions curator, Dr. Luck. Lord Luke was able to join us, and we were very grateful for the opportunity to see these incredible artworks. Conservator Emma Cox produced a very useful conservation report on the cartoons. Maclise's draftsmanship is breathtaking. Following the exhibition of the cartoons, he was given a gold, a gold porte crayon by his fellow artists as a token of their admiration. You can see why his fellow artists were so impressed. The attention to detail is quite staggering. Military uniforms, headwear, musical instruments, horse tackle and so on, all carefully researched, with Prince Albert providing specific advice in respect to Blücher's Prussian forces. In 1718, French surgeon Jean-Louis Petit developed a screw device, or tourniquet, for occluding blood flow in surgical sites. In the cartoon we see here, a soldier with a tourniquet, tourniquet positioned on his, soul, in his shoulder where it could not work. This technical mistake is, was spotted and corrected for the final painting. However, if we look at the finished painting, 
here using infrared reflectography to show the underdrawing. Interestingly, the tourniquet, as depicted in the painting, is correctly positioned. This is just one of thousands of details in the paintings. Um, here I also give you an example of an authentic petit tourniquet. Albeit mounted in the wrong position in the cartoon, the surgical apparatus is drawn in incredible detail. The correct position on the arm in the final painting was most probably undertaken on the advice of MacLeese's own brother, Joseph, a surgeon, who was apparently also an excellent draftsman. Nancy Weston, in her absorbing book, Daniel MacLeese, Irish Artist in Victorian London, sets out the political and social context for the imagery used by MacLeese in Waterloo and other works. In Waterloo, we find a commentary on Irish-British history, and not least his own personal experience as a proud Irishman of Presbyterian Scottish descent living in London. MacLeese jokingly called himself a Corconian Cockney. The soldier with the tourniquet, as depicted in the cartoon, becomes a piper in the painting, with his pipes at his side and wearing a red and green kilt. This is an Irishman. If we look just below where he's been shot are his tattoos. Between the Union flag and the George Rex initials is a shamrock. This is an Irish hero, loyal to Ireland and the Crown, one of the many Irish heroes depicted in Waterloo. The most significant of these is Wellington himself, whom MacLeese and his fellow Irishmen laid claim as their man. Here are a few insights into the work the students are currently undertaking. Among the first tasks were to undertake an in-situ survey of the original technique and to investigate what materials have been added. Minute samples have been taken from the paintings and the results of various analyses will provide us with an improved knowledge about the original and added materials and of the deterioration processes. Likewise, a survey of the condition of the paintings has been undertaken by the students. This uh, survey, using CAD software, allows you to quantify the exact amounts of damage. Other investigations include detailed photography, including raking, raking light photography. Here a detail from Trafalgar showing the grade areas of deterioration. This close-up image of the Trafalgar painting surface in raking light shows how the plaster is flat, but the texture is very granular. Video microscopy reveals the nature of the painting surface and its condition. The microscopy shows the whitish upper surface of the sand grains, which are no longer covered with pigment. This is the speckled effect, which was noted in 1900. This may in part be due to a failure in the fixing, but equally, early cleaning treatments may be responsible for removing the pigment from these areas. Here we also have an, an example of ultraviolet fluorescence imaging to help show the added coatings and other phenomena. Again, ultraviolet imaging shows the extensive retouching, mainly on the Waterloo painting. Infrared reflectography can be used to penetrate the darkened surface materials and paint layer to reveal any carbon-based underdrawing which may be present. Remarkably, on the later Trafalgar painting seen here, there is no evidence for preliminary drawing. Indeed, there was no cartoon produced for this work. We know that MacLeese used models and original items on the scaffold when painting. Here one can see finely painting painted strengthening of particular passages of painting. These may be the type of corrective painting added by MacLeese on top of the fixed painting, question mark. It is very precise and different to the cruder retouching found elsewhere on the painting. Here an example in greater detail, strengthening of the striped trouser material. Here one can appreciate the level of detail detail and the painted materials and textures, textures within the painting. The Trafalgar painting has no evidence for underdrawing or squaring up at all. Let us contrast this with the extensive underdrawing found on the Waterloo painting. 
By contrast here, this painting transferred from a cartoon, probably by inserting a piece of charcoal-covered paper under the cartoon and tracing through, just like you do with carbon paper. Pentimenti, or corrections, made by Maclise can also be observed. By the way, this is the painting, not the cartoon. This is the, this, this is the uh, underdrawing that we can see here using infrared uh, reflectography. Um, you can also see later crude retouching here, uh, visible in this image. Here are the latest preliminary results to the materials that we've found. Plaster, lime plaster, but also gypsum. That we didn't expect. Water glass, small traces of potassium, but very little. Pigments, this is a work in progress, but the pigments range also to typical 19th century pigments. There are resins and coatings on the paintings. There's the wax paraffin coating I mentioned, there's beeswax, and there's chlorides present from the cleaning, probably in, from the cleaning in 1963. There's also shellac on the paintings, but not on all of the painting. We have no results yet for the greying areas I showed you on the Trafalgar painting. Finally, I show you potential for improvement to the paintings through changing lighting. In this simple example, the colour temperature is changed to daylight illumination. This provides a much more satisfactory colour balance, and further testing will be undertaken in this campaign by Zimon Gabler. Science. Yes, of course. How did you do that then? Just by shining a different light on the paintings. As simple as that. I, I would just like to thank my colleagues, Lord Luke, and uh, colleagues from the Royal Academy, um, also Conservatives Kate Code, uh, Corder and Elizabeth Woolley. Um, thank you very much. And we're open to questions. <laughs>
Christine Sowen Purcell from the House of Lords. Am I right in thinking that when the first um, painting was being completed, or rather, sorry, when the second one was being started, it was already noted that the first one was deteriorating? Is that right? Because I, I suppose my question is one that can't be answered. It's due with the humanity of the situation. How could the, um, McLeese have the stamina to continue with the second painting whilst witnessing the deterioration of the first painting? I know. It, it sounds a little bit, bit strange. Perhaps, shall I answer that? Is, it, is that a better? Okay. I think the, I think the issue here is, is we need to take a, little, a few steps back. When McLeese was painting the Nelson painting, the Waterloo painting had been boxed in, so one couldn't see it for a number of years. The, the early signs of efflorescence, it's quite typical to have that sort of efflorescence, this sort of salts appearing on the surface in water glass technique. So I think they would have expected that to be just a, a teething problem, something that could be brushed off, salts that could be brushed off and wouldn't be, a, wouldn't be such a problem. It's later, after the initial cleanings, I think, and, and if you imagine also boxing in a painting isn't necessarily so good in terms of a, 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 an environmental, um, an environmental um, microclimate, because if you remember to the report which mentions mildew appearing on the paintings, etc. So I think you've got all of that early history, which was really bad luck for McLeese, but I don't think he would have thought it was a problem with the technique necessarily at that stage. Yeah. Um, Helen Valentine, Royal Academy of Arts. Um, I was just interesting if you could enlarge at all about how you think he went about painting, for instance, the um, Wellington and Blucher picture, because you say that you haven't found evidence of underdrawing at all? On the Wellington, yes. Uh, so there's on, no evidence? Yes, on the Wellington, There yes. is on the Wellington, yes. but not on uh, the... That's the one we have the cartoon for, we, we have the transfer. Yes. Yes. But what about the other one? On the now, on the now, and Trafalgar, we don't. Do you want to talk? I'd, I'd love <laughs> you to, 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 to say something. Um, have a go. <coughs> uh, no, we, we haven't find that we haven't found any um, underdrawing uh, on the surface of the from um, Nelson that Nelson painting, and only on the other one on the Wellington Blücher. So, do you have any ideas how? he would have worked on this. Yes, I, 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 my personal view is that he was, he, w he was such a talented draftsman that he could, he could work from a, from a sketch or from, you know, some of the elements, for example, are um, things like the ropes and the various elements he would have had with him on the scaffold, definitely. We couldn't find, also with some of the larger diagonals on the, vic on the victory, we couldn't find any indication of pencil, um, uh, indentations, uh, um, any sorts of um, uh, preparatory techniques at all. That doesn't mean to say they're not there, but they're not visible in infrared, and they're not visible in, um, in, in, uh, with, a, with a microscope. Um, it is, that painting is 50 square meters of painting. So it, isn't, it could be at the end of our project that we'll say we found something in the key. But it's also, to, to, he, he was a very talented draftsman and, and quite how he did it I don't know. I wondered about, about things like projection or something, uh, camera obscura or something like that for some of it. But we would expect to see some painting. It could be that he painted it, you know, in a terms of alla prima, mm -hmm. painting alla prima. Oh, um, Tim Redmond, uh, I work in the Department of Information Services uh, mm. here in Parliament. Um, I was actually at the Walker Gallery in Liverpool last week, so I saw McLeese's oil painting uh, of the death of Nelson. But in the same room, very close by, is Benjamin West's um, portrayal of exactly the same scene and titled The Death of Nelson. And I have a sneaky suspicion that uh, McLeese took a lot of... Um, um, 
his ideas for the death of Nelson from Benjamin West's painting, because Benjamin West's was painted in the 1820s, so only 20 years after the death of Nelson. And there are a lot of really um, strong similarities, particularly in the positioning of the main characters um, mm. it, with Maclise's. It's interesting you say, you say that, because Maclise was... Um, uh, Maclise was sort of fourth through, through Benjamin West's version of, 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 of the depiction of Trafalgar. He was for, forced to place Nelson above decks on, mm. and, and not below decks. Mm. And Maclise would have known that. He'd, he'd obviously done all the research. But because it was sort of this, this, this image of Nelson on, on board and the painting of, uh, by West, etc., particularly the painting of, of West, um, he was forced to, to, change, to, to create that inaccuracy. So I think you're, you're, you're certainly right that it was a major influence, um, but certainly it, it was the influence that caused that major inaccuracy in the painting, because nobody would have accepted a, a painting of, of uh, Nelson below deck, sorry. It, it's worthwhile pointing out, too, the, the involvement of the Fine Arts Commission. And the Fine Arts Commission had um, a variety of expertise. They had the historian Lord Macaulay, they had others who would have been very closely involved in the um, design of, of, of both paintings that Maclise was working on. So th there was quite a lot of influence that he would have been given, he would have been told about, and which he would have had to incorporate in, in his designs. Um, my name's Catherine, I work for the Department of Information too. Um, same as Tim. How do you think Daniel MacLeese would have felt today if he was here in this room, um, 150 years later, finding out these results? Yeah, no, well, it's a really good question, and, and I'm going to throw, throw it over to my, to, to, to my students, but I just want to say thank you very much, because you're one of the people who came and asked us questions when we were working, so thank you very much. It, uh, do you want to hear it in here? How was he feeling for MacLeese when he was yes. still alive? <laughs> proud of his work mm. also because um, so I was in when I was looking in Germany for this, uh, for some examples and then I tried to compare the two Maclise paintings and the examples I found in Germany and the quality of the Maclise painting is, uh, it's, it's really wonderful so, mm. and um, so I know that now <laughs> and yeah, I think he can be proud of it. Yeah, yeah he would be very... I mean, Maclise was devastated yeah. at what happened about the paintings. Yeah. And I mentioned earlier that you know, this was the high point of his entire career. Yeah. And he, he was offered other um, commissions, mm -hmm. for example, St. Stephen's Hall, um, the paintings there. And he turned it down knowing and hoping um, that he would be given um, the, the task of doing the paintings in the Royal Gallery. So we had only seven years, and we had the Waterloo painting, and then the the great Nelson painting. He, he's been vindicated. In, uh, mm. uh, he's been vindicated. He, you know, yeah. after 150 years, I see it as that wasn't. You know, these paintings are in, are in a terrific condition. They're in a very good condition, actually. You know, this is this is what we found so, so far. Mm. The plaster is in good condition. Uh, it's we've, we've stood uh, bomb bomb damage uh, at least to the fenestration uh, from the Second World War. Um, there's some minor cracks caused by that, but no failure of, of, of the plastering technique. There's no great flaking of the paint layer, etc., etc. Um, the we hope the paintings can be, the the, the uh, presentation of the paintings can be improved. Um, but it's more the, 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 the treatment with the wax and the, the various wax treatments, etc., and all of these things that, of course, have led to the, the damage. They can't have known in 1874 that by adding water to the surface would have mobilized any salts that were present and caused even more, um, more efflorescence. They can't have known that by adding any organic coating to the paintings would have also... Um, would pick up 
uh, the dirt and, and, and debris and darken the paintings. So all of these things were mistakes that were made early on. So Paul MacLeese was blamed, mm -hmm. but it wasn't him. And after all, he was forced to use this technique. So um, I think I prefer to think, think that he, he, was, he was bold enough to, use, to, 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 to introduce um, um, uh, this, this technique which I understand Herbert tried to, to, to really take from him and say that he had brought the, the, the technique to, to England. But um, anyway, I, I think he, 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 went out, he went out to Germany, he looked, at the, he looked at the technique, he researched it, and it's probably in a better condition than most of the examples in Germany. If not all of them, that's yet to be uh, fully researched. But that's, uh, uh, perhaps one final question. Um, Caroline Shenton from the Parliamentary Archives. Apologies if I missed this. I'm, I'm not clear um, how common the water glass technique actually was in Germany and elsewhere, and perhaps how long it went on for in the 19th century. Could you let us know that? Oh, yes. Well, there's a, there's a develop of that, development of, 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 the, of the water glass technique in Germany. But I'll let uh, um, Sheridan. Ian Vickram from Wasserglass. Uh, it's interesting time. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, um, ah, okay. <laughs> so, Mr. Fuchs was the um, he, he invented he it. Invented it yeah. And um, so, and he said for this kind of um, art, stereochromy, and this was in the time between 1850, no, 1847 and 1847. This was the first. This was the time when the for first painting was created in Berlin from Mr. Kaulbach. And then he died, and then Pettenkoffer came. And in the 1817, in the middle of the 1817, so um, Adolf Wilhelm Kain, he was also in German chemistry. chemistry. Um, he tried to make some modifications with this technique. That means um, he made modifications with the binder and with the pigments, so that the problems for the um, for the fixing of the paint layer um, were more. That yeah, the, the, there were less problems yeah. with the technique. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, and yeah. this was the beginning of the so-called mineral malerei, mineral painting in German, let's say, or the the kind of colors. So it was around for about 40 years or so. No, kind, kind of painting then, then really took off. It's that's that's when it took off. So the first, the, the, that first sort of uh, 30 years or so <coughs> was, was this first stereochromy um, based, based on um, uh, uh, Fuchs and then Pettenkofer. But, but it's really after Kain, 1870, 1871, around that sort of time, that it really takes off this mineral painting with Kain Baden. And they're still used today. Okay. And you can still paint with that today. And you see lots of examples, also then later examples in the 1920s and 30s throughout the Netherlands and then expanding into France, etc. So that was very popular. But this was more restricted, really, to high-quality high commissions. OK, if we can perhaps draw to a close um, the lecture tonight, and if I can thank very much um, Professor Adrian Heritage, and both um, Simon Gebler and Geraldine Krautweiser um, for their sterling work. Um, as we've said, it's work in progress. Uh, we're now halfway through the, the year, and we hope very much that by the end of the year, we'll have the opportunity to hold a similar uh, lecture and give you even more good news and the potential for what may be possible to bring back MacLeese's glorious uh, paintings. Many thanks.